Ravi Sufan, welcome to In Conversation. Great to be with you. America, the world, watched with horror at the attack on the Capitol. Why weren't the American authorities more prepared? Why didn't they know what was going to happen? Frankly, it was a structural failure. Um, everything uh, that happened that day was planned in plain sight. But unfortunately, our government, our institutions, our politicians here in the United States, still not looking seriously at the threat of uh, radical um, violent extremists here in the United States to include conspiracy theorists, to include white supremacists, ultra-right groups. And uh, I hope uh, the insurrection that took place on uh, January 6 was frankly a wake-up call for a lot of these institutions and entities and the government and the politicians that there is a threat within uh, and that uh, threat just did a significant strike to the heart of our democracy that damaged our republic's reputation around the world and de further divided us. Mr. Sufan, you're a former FBI special agent and you've been talking about this for years. Why hasn't anyone been listening? I think uh, some people were listening. I mean, uh, by every metric, white supremacy extremism uh, recently has been uh, the biggest terrorism threat in the U.S. And this is according to the FBI, this is according to uh, Homeland Security. Even the U.N. has noted that over the last five years, uh, there has been, uh, I think, 320%, 320% rise in terrorist attacks by groups and by individuals affiliated uh, with such movements and ideologies. In the U.S., just between 2001 and 2016, our data shows that over 70% of lethal violent extremist incidents were caused by individuals who adhere to far-right uh, violent extremist ideologies. What about commentators who say that it was the failure of the Trump administration? It is actually specifically a failure of President Trump. You know what, and it's a very fair uh, assessment, uh, but this has been going on for a few years. This frankly has been going on before even President Trump took over. President Trump, uh, his policies, his narrative, his rhetoric emboldened uh, these folks uh, on the fringe and kind of like pushed them to be more and more mainstream. And he took advantage of their passion, of their organization, of their uh, anger and grievances um, for his own uh, political cause. Uh, however, these things has been going on for a while. And we've been monitoring this for a while. And, uh, you know, in, and, and I think one of the interesting thing about it too, that it is not only a domestic terrorism threat, even though we label it as domestic terrorism threat, this white supremacy, this neo-Nazi extremism, um, you know, it has a transnational network and it even imitate the tactics, uh, the techniques, the procedures, the modus operandi of Salafi Jihadi groups, groups like Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS. And we've been analyzing this for years. Yes, because you've said that it's not actually domestic terrorism, or it may be misleading to just call it domestic terrorism. It has much wider roots, which is even more frightening, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything that we've seen with the jihadis in the 80s and 90s, we're seeing now with this white supremacist movement, um, you know, and we've seen uh, what they can do, not only in January 6th, we've seen what they did in Norway, we've seen what they did in, um, in, in, in uh, Christchurch, and in, in New Zealand, we've seen the connections, um, the, the shared grievances that they have. We have been looking to groups like uh, the Autumn Wafton Division that have literally units in many Western countries, groups like the Russian Imperial Movement that uh, State Department under President Trump, I have to say, uh, designated them as a special, uh, gave them a special des a designation as uh, a terrorist organization. Uh, this is the first time in the history of America a group uh, is designated as a terrorist, uh, a white supremacist group, sorry, is specially designated as a terrorist organization. Um, and, and the similarities is what made us pay attention to them in the first place. You know, I testified in Congress about two years ago about the transnational network. Um, and one of the things that we've seen um, that they copy the jihadis in so many different ways. For example, they talk about an alleged great replacement of whites 
um, in the same ways jihadis talk uh, about a supposed war against Islam. You know, jihadis make martyrdom videos. White supremacists publish uh, manifestos. Uh, jihadis upload beheading videos. White supremacists live stream their attacks online. Uh, jihadis employ violence to create a religiously pure society. White supremacists likewise employ and advocate for violence to create a racially pure society. The comparison even extend to the naming, the naming of groups uh, within these movements. For example, there is a neo-Nazi group here, here in the United States. They call themselves the base, the translation from the Arabic of Al-Qaeda. They actually use Al-Qaeda manuals. They use Al-Qaeda publication. They talk about white jihad, and that's the term we, we've, hear, uh, we've been hearing, not only in the United States, but few other European countries. These groups, they learn a lot from the jihadis and they learn what to do and what not to do, you know, based on the experiences of the jihadis and the war on terror. The government totally failed in response to pandemic. And when you don't have transparency, you create a vacuum for conspiracy theories. people who say that extremist white groups uh, or neo-Nazis have always existed in the US. The Ku Klux Klan, sadly, has been around for years, for decades, and they have just been in this undertow of what's existed in the US. Is it possible that these white extremists can also continue there in the fringe and mainstream society doesn't have to worry about them? We always had this issue, but these groups have been on the fringe. What happened recently, because of the partisan division, because of the, um, you know, the, 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 the political, the poisonous political narrative in the United States, these individuals now they feel emboldened and they feel they are mainstream. So what we need to do is to deal with the threat. Otherwise, we're going to have a situation on our hand, uh, very similar uh, to what happened in the Middle East with groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda reaching out to people with grievances. Uh, who have been brainwashed with lies and conspiracy theories about America and about the West and about everything that's happening in their lives, blame everything on the United States. And they, um, groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda come to them and say, you know what, we are the only solution for your problem. Uh, because the groups here, like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, they don't believe in democracy. They don't believe in election. The moment they take power, they're not going to give it up. And, and for the first time, in decades, uh, they feel uh, really emboldened and they feel that they have a chance and they feel they have a bigger network internationally that might support their initiative. And that's why one of the things that we're doing here is working closely uh, with our allies and closely with our government, even during the Trump administration, to start designating some of these uh, organizations as terrorist organizations internationally, because as you know, in the United States, we do not have domestic terrorism laws. In the United States, even Timothy McVeigh, who blew up a whole federal building in 1995, he was not prosecuted or charged with terrorism charges. That needs to change in order to tackle the problem that we have on hands. And designation is one of it. Because with designation, a lot of the tools available uh, to go after international terrorists, we can use it to go after the violent, the violent extremists here in the United States. But what's puzzling is that with the pandemic, most people would think with the lockdowns, with the restriction of movement, that would have in itself also dampened some level of this violent extremism. But it hasn't. It's very logical what you're saying, 
But the problem is all these conspiracies are happening because of the misinformation and disinformation terrorism nexus. You know, most of these lies are happening on, on, on social media, are happening on, you know, uh, different platforms uh, where people form echo chambers and just listen to others who basically uh, are peddling the same lies and conspiracies. And some of these lies and conspiracies, frankly, come also from the president of the United States at the time, you know, the former president. So actually the pandemic, uh, significantly contribute to the problem that we have today because people are not really, um, you know, going out and meeting other people outside their cliques, uh, meeting other people outside their, their uh, you know, echo chambers, if you want to call it. But also at the same time, uh, what happened with these groups is because, you know, the government totally failed in our government here in response to pandemic. And when you fail, and when you don't have transparency, you create a vacuum for conspiracy theories. Uh, so you have, you know, uh, QAnon come and saying all these lies about the pandemic and about vaccines and about, uh, you know, what the government is trying to do in order to control the public. And this is all a conspiracy by, you know, Jews and, uh, and, 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 and leftist socialists, Democrats to basically rule with tyranny in the United States. And that contributed more more towards the threat. Now that President Trump, though, is no longer in office, will that at least take some of the wind out of the sails of American-based white supremacists? It's a very good question. I think uh, definitely the rhetoric of President Trump, in a way, emboldened these groups. Uh, not all the supporters of President Trump are adhering to, uh, you know, white supremacy ideologies or not all his supporters are neo-Nazis in any way, shape or form. However, these uh, extremists, domestic extremist groups are trying to take advantage of the political division that we have here in the United States. We are monitoring their channels now. And what they say is that, hey, this is our opportunity to reach out to all these uh, Trump uh, voters or, uh, you know, Trump supporters, and they actually call them the megatards, uh, you know, let's reach out to them and try to tell them that we are the only solution for all these grievances. Uh, politics don't matter. Politicians, they lie to you. They're going to throw you under the bus. We are the only people who can achieve the goals that you need. And guess what? This election is a stolen and because it's a stolen, you don't have representation in the government. And they are trying to recruit more and more people into the rank. So it is extremely important. How are we going to face that? Are we going to stand uh, together in a bipartisan way and, uh, you know, uh, have a strong message that, uh, you know, uh, this big lie about the election being stolen is, is a fake lie. Looking at Southeast Asia, what do you think is going to happen? We've seen also some leaders who tend to play that racial card or religious card. In India, Mr. Modi is promoting a very pro-Hindu stance, which some say is really pushing out minorities. You know, we've, especially in the last decade or so, we've been seeing a lot of ethnic politics. Uh, we see it in many different countries. Uh, we see it, you know, even with the Uyghurs in China. We see it, as you mentioned correctly, in, with India. Uh, so this is a very dangerous trend, and that's why we need to be very forceful in uh, listening to the grievances of both sides and leading. The United States have to lead in this. Um, we have to be humble and um, you know, talk about our own experiences and our own failures domestically, but build upon it uh, and, 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 and lead internationally in order to kind of create a situation where these things don't take us to uh, very dangerous fault lines down the road because many countries now are using ethnicities, are using sectarianism, are using you know, religious politics as as a tool, as a geopolitical tool for their hegemony in, the re in their own regions or for their control in their own country. Was Twitter right in banning Trump after the attack on the Capitol? Well, Twitter is a private company.
Was Twitter right in banning Trump after the attack on the Capitol? Well, Twitter is a private company. Twitter is not a government. So um, they have um, an agreement with all the people who use their platforms. And if people did not adhere to that agreement, um, Twitter has the right to ban them. Now, President Trump is probably the first world leader ever uh, to be banned from Twitter. But also that came after an insurrection, that came after the tweets that were analyzed that it might create significant violence during the inauguration. Um, after a lot of evidence that the Twitter and other platforms found on their platform of planning uh, to coordinate attacks in the capitals of the 50 states uh, during inauguration. Luckily, the law enforcement and uh, the Pentagon and the FBI were able to kind of, you know, push back um, against these threats. But it's a private company and they have the right to say, look, you know what, if anything happened, we don't want our platform to be involved in this. However, they did that way too late. Yes, they was did it that too little, way too, too late. late. Exactly, they allowed these conspiracies, they allowed these lies, not only with the white supremacists, not only with even President Trump, not only with, but with all the conspiracy. They allowed the things to be on their, on their, on their platforms. They allow it to poison the minds of so many people. And now when we reach the situation that this might be horrible and they will be held accountable um, they're like, oh, you know what? We really don't want anything to do with that. Social media um, need to be, we need to figure out to regulate these platforms if they cannot regulate it themselves. What about the argument though from Europe who say that Twitter should not be the one who regulates what goes on to the platform, but rather that there should be um, incitement to racial or other types of hatred laws the way there are in Germany. If America merely had that, then it would have been much easier to step in much earlier by proper authorities, not even by Twitter's CEO. It's a very good uh, argument. And I think maybe we need to do something here in the United States. However, we still have something called the First Amendment. And it is going to be very difficult to challenge some of the narratives. You know, the First Amendment give you the right to be an idiot, give you the right to be hateful, give you a right to say a lot of bad things. But also at the same time, the First Amendment does not give you the right to yell fire in a crowded theater, right? So there is something here that needs to be done. So far, the, these private platforms are saying, look, no, 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 we can regulate ourselves. We don't want the government to, to regulate it. We are like into the you know, open internet and the issue of privacy and the issue of, but they failed again and again and again, they failed. And that's not only in America. You see, for example, because of a post in India, how many people probably sometimes die. And these are documented cases or, uh, you know, what happened in other places. I mean, we can go country by country. So they need to be held accountable and they need to be regulated. And I truly, I personally don't believe that they can regulate themselves because towards the end, it's all about a profit for them. Uh, it's all about engagement. Um, you know, hateful narrative create more engagement. Engagement means money. Um, so that's why they need to be regulated from outside. What about the argument, though, from the social media groups who say that they can't always keep up with all of this? If, let's say, somebody does something hateful, like shoot somebody in a church or a mosque and videos it and posts it immediately, it still takes that, it takes that minutes and that's those terrible minutes when it's up there where everybody can see it. So unless we're saying that we're going to have AI that's going to be able to clamp it down immediately, which would also be a scary thing, there doesn't seem to be a good solution. A lot of technical solutions that they can use. And some countries around the world that force the social media companies to do something, you don't see these things happening. Like for example, you don't see a lot of these open platforms in China on Facebook and stuff like that. There's a lot of things that can go on Facebook. A lot of things cannot go on Facebook. In Germany, for example, you cannot show an image of a swastika. Um, so all the videos uh, on Facebook and other platforms have no swastikas. So they have technological capabilities to do so. See, the, these social media companies, they go to ad agencies and they say, hey, we can monitor everything 
on our platform. Because we monitor everything, we can monetize everything for you. So put your ads with us. But when it comes to hateful speech and conspiracies and lies, we go to them and they say, well, we cannot monitor everything. So either you can monitor it and monetize it, or you cannot monitor it and you cannot monetize it. Choose which one do you want? So you're basically saying you are, you don't buy that argument that they're, they're giving. I don't buy that argument. I don't buy that argument. And we can look today on Twitter, on Facebook, on many of these platforms, and we still see hate speech. We still see lies being peddled. We still see conspiracy theories, not only in the United States, but, but around the world. Ali Sufan, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. It's a great pleasure talking to you.